Uh, good evening to uh, one and all. I am Sneha from uh, Learnit. The dedication session designed for the seamless experience of the session. Learnit is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by the Indian Association of Preventive and the Society of Medicine. Invite you all over to this webinar, the How to Do in Statistical Test. Learnit is India's most trusted and widely used digital platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for the doctors. Let's begin with today's session. For that, I would like to welcome Dr. Animesh Jain Sao, who will be the today's moderator, and also speaker Aisha B. Ma'am. So, without further delay, I want to take this hand over to this session to Dr. Animesh Jain Sao. Over to you, sir. Kindly proceed for your talk. Thank you. And I paste uh, the link in the chat box. I will request everyone to go through this link. Thank you. Okay. So am I audible now? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so welcome everyone for this session on how to choose a statistical test. As you all know that we've been conducting these webinars quite some time. It's been, and this is Indian Association of Preventive and Social Medicine Karnataka chapter. And today we have this topic on choosing a statistical test. So how to go about it, the nitty gritties, and what are the precautions to take, some tips and tricks. Dr. Asha will be our speaker. And uh, before I go on to introducing her, I would like to have Dr. Poonam, who's with us, and the president of our IAPS in Karnataka chapter, to just uh, give us some introductory remarks. Dr. Poonam, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Animish. Uh, a very good evening to all and uh, greetings from IAPSM Karnataka chapter. So as Dr. Animish uh, mentioned, this uh, IAPP, that is Intercollegiate Academy Postgraduate Program, this has been an academic platform and now it is one of the important components of IAPSM Karnataka chapter as well. So we have been organizing a couple of academic uh, sessions uh, since uh, last few months uh, in an online mode. Uh, so earlier, uh, it was through Google Meet where we, we were, it was possible for us to have a bi-directional interaction with the participants, but then somehow it got stopped and we were only on uh, YouTube. But it is nice to see that Clarnet has uh, facilitated this uh, interaction with the participants today where all the participants or audience are also on the uh, Zoom platform. And uh, so if there is anything that they would like to clarify or want to know more from a resource person, it would be nice they can... Uh, either paste it in the chat box or they can note down their questions. And at the end, I'm sure Dr. Asha would uh, address uh, those clarifying questions of the participants as well. And uh, I understand all the medical colleges, now it's the time for uh, almost all the first year postgraduates to submit their dissertation synopsis. So this particular uh, session on how to choose a statistical test will definitely be of uh, great use to them and also others as well. So uh, Dr. Asha, the, uh, I thank you on behalf of IAPSM Karnataka chapter for taking this session and I talk the, thank Dr. Animish uh, Jain for moderating uh, this uh, session. Thank you and welcome to all. And thank you, Dr. Poonam. So just to briefly introduce those who have not attended, the, this is actually a series and part two of what we had done last month. So part one, we had the basics of statistics uh, and then today is the second part of that we are continuing. So Dr. Asha is going to focus on how to choose a statistical test and she will go into inferential statistics as well. So briefly to introduce Dr. Asha to you, Dr. Asha is an associate professor at the SS Institute of Medical Sciences and Research in Davangere. She is also the joint secretary of IAPS in Karnataka chapter and, and going to be actively engaged in hosting the conference next year, the state conference next year. And Dr. Asha has been very much keen uh, in teaching and particularly about research. And of course, she's won many awards and other things. So I'll not go into too much of details of that right now. But what I would like you to understand is that she's put in a lot of efforts. In fact, last time also we had a very nice uh, uh, quiz as well. And this time, if you see the chat box, there's a Google form pasted already. The link has been pasted. So I, I would really appreciate and I would really uh, ask the participants to make use of this opportunity and try out those things. Because once you do that, and then you will get to know where you stand or what uh, you are aware of and what you are probably not. And Dr. Asha will take you through that. And then of course, she will discuss all those things as well. What is there in the, the, uh, the link that has been pasted. So with that brief introduction, let me hand it over to Dr. Asha, who will take us through the 
session and please feel free to uh, ask her questions put uh, your thoughts in the chat box or appreciation as well as queries only one request is in the middle of the session please uh, keep yourself muted we will definitely have an opportunity for you to interact and that's one of the reasons why we have switched to dr poonam was insistent we were also exploring and we thank learnet for providing us this platform where we can have a bidirectional interaction so actually we will have an opportunity where we can actually uh, you know interact with the resource person so uh, only thing is just request you to hold on for a while while she presents and then she will definitely give you all the uh, insights that you need or clarify your doubts so over to you dr asha Sir, yeah, just one um, point uh, before we proceed. Uh, uh, participants, because uh, as most of you are postgraduates and through this particular IPP forum of IPSM Karnataka chapter, we, we are interested in or we look forward for conducting academic sessions which would be of more useful and relevance from postgraduates' point of view. And also, I see certain faculty also. So, if uh, uh, we would like to invite suggestions both from faculty and from postgraduates as well, so you can please post in the chat box also. Uh, so that uh, we can have a would be able to address them in the forthcoming events uh, yeah one yes, more dr. thing i want to yeah so good that you brought that up dr poonam in fact this time in the form itself we had asked for and we've mm. got some suggestions as well and the other thing is i'm very happy to say that we have i think more than 250 registrations this time and that is pan india you know so that's that's really nice so we do we uh, want this platform to be available to everybody and all this what is being done is actually being uh, again put up on our youtube channel of iapsm karnataka so this is a resource for everybody it's not that you know iapsm karnataka will restrict it to our state it's for everybody and i'm really glad that many people from different places have registered and even some faculty and senior professors are there so uh, welcome to this forum and please feel free to use this platform for your learning and propagate it even among your friends and, and colleagues or juniors who have not been able to attend today. Soon this will be shortly put up on the YouTube channel and we will share the link. So thank you. And over to you, Dr. Ash. Thank you, sir. Uh, so this is the second part of uh, biostatistics. And in this uh, session, I'll be covering about um, how to choose a statistical test. Uh, so I'll share the screen and then we'll discuss important points. I hope the screen is uh, visible now. Sir, is it visible? Sir, are the slides being... Uh, Ma'am, your screens are visible. Yeah. Yeah, it's visible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move with the uh, session. So this topic is how to choose a statistical test. So I have mainly designed it uh, concentrating postgraduates in mind. And in this topic, uh, we will be dealing with the concept of population and sample. And then we look into steps in selecting the statistical test and we'll see what are the different types of statistical tests. As we all know that we, they are mainly divided into descriptive and inferential. And lastly, we'll see the importance of clinical and statistical significance before we decide anything uh, to, to do a study or not. Um, coming to concept of population and sample. As we all know that whenever we want to do a study, uh, on a population, we cannot do it on a whole population. Yeah, we cannot do it on a whole population because of uh, time, money, and then manpower. So what we do is, uh, we take a sample out of the population randomly, and then we do a study on this sample. So from the sample, sample we get some numerical numbers, which represents the sample. So this. Uh, numbers, whatever we get from the sample, we call it as statistics. And from this statistical numbers, we interpret or we guess what could be our population parameter. So this is the fundamental uh, idea about whenever we are doing a study. So how to interpret this population parameters with the help of sample numbers is with the help of this statistical test. So now looking at what are these statistical tests, 
these are nothing but mathematical tools which are applied on the sample and they are mainly used for two things one is to make inferences about population from the sample which we have uh, collected and the second one is to uh, test the null hypothesis so these are the main two reasons why statistical tests are used directly moving to how to select the statistical test the decision to choose a statistical test mainly lies on four things the first one is the type of variable the second one is type of study. The third one is data distribution. And the fourth one is objective of the study. So let us look into each of the steps in detail. So moving to first step, what we have is the type of the variable. So in the last session, we have seen how the data needs to be classified based on the nature of the variable. It can be either qualitative data or it can be quantitative data. So further, again, qualitative data can be nominal or it can be ordinal based on the order. And quantitative can be discrete or uh, continuous. So many of the statistical tests actually they rely on discrete and then continuous type of data. Let's see this with again uh, with some examples. First step in deciding about the variable is to identify the variable. So whenever we are doing a study, we have to identify what is the study variable. And from where do we get this? We get this from the objective. So once the variable is identified, the next step is we have to identify what is the type of the variable we are looking at. For example, if my study objective says to determine the prevalence of anemia among pregnant women. So then it would be just present, like how many of them uh, had anemic and how many of them were non-anemic. So in that case, my variable will be discrete type of variable. If my objective says to determine the mean hemoglobin, then my variable will be mean hemoglobin and it will be continuous in nature. If my objective says to grade the anemia, then my uh, variable will be mild, moderate, and severe. So then it will be ordinal type of variable. So though it is all related with anemia or some specific topic, we have to look into the objective and uh, identifying or uh, the objective plays an uh, actually a very important role because it helps us in identifying the variable. And once a uh, variable is identified, then we have to see what type of variable is this. After seeing uh, what is the type of variable, and uh, then we'll move to the second step that is understand the type of study. So usually whenever we talk about studies uh, in epidemiology, we see that it is whether it is case control, cohort, cross-sectional, and so we usually grade it in uh, such type of things. But however, in statistics, we usually, we don't see in that types, but we see uh, two things. One is who are the test subjects and the other one is how many groups are there in the uh, uh, study. So based on test subjects, they can be considered as paired group or they can be considered as unpaired group. So paired group is when the measurements are taken on the same group at different locations or at different sites, then we call that study subjects, they belong to a paired group. Example, measuring blood pressure before and after giving a drug or uh, giving drug A to one A and then drug B to one more I on the same person. So whenever the same person acts as a control, so then we call them as paired group. So whereas in unpaired group, the comparison is made between two different groups, totally different groups, treatment group and control group. So here the control group is entirely different as uh, uh, unlike the paired group, where in paired group, the control group, it's the same person will act as a control group. So the next point to look under type of studies number of groups in the study. So the study might have a single group, it might have a two, it might have two groups or uh, they can have more than two groups. So usually uh, uh, whenever we are having a, um, unpaired group, I mean, uh, yeah, unpaired groups, it is usually two groups, but usually in paired groups, again, we'll have to take it as two groups or three groups based on number of measurements. If the measurements are made twice, then it has to be two groups. If the measurements are made thrice, then we have to take it as three groups because the same group acts as a control here. So uh, the two things, what we have to see under type of studies, one is whether the study subjects belong to a paired group or an unpaired group, and then how many types of groups are there in the study. Going to third point, uh, identify the tape type of data distribution with the help of normality tests. See, uh, if the data is discrete, there is no need of running normality tests. This we have discussed in the last session also. So they often follow non-normal distribution. Only if the data is continuous in nature, then we have to apply normality tests. And then we have to see whether the data, the continuous data belongs to normal or it is non-normal type of distribution. 
So again, in the last session, we have uh, seen that normality of the normality of the data distribution can be assessed by two things. One is visual method, and one more is normality test. Since visual methods is subjective, it is uh, better to go for normality test to assess the normality. And there are many normality tests. In that, uh, the most important one or the commonly used one are Shapiro built test, and then we have Kolmogorov Smirnov test, and even the Relief Force corrected case test is also used to test the normality. So I'm just giving an example of Shapiro will test. The interpretation of the results provided by normality test is same that of the statistical test, where we need to assess the strength of evidence against a null hypothesis. So here, what is the null hypothesis state? The null hypothesis states that the data is normally distributed. So if the p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, then we have to reject the null hypothesis. Then we can tell that the data is not, uh, not normally distributed. If the probability value is greater than 0 0.05, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then we have to tell that the data is following normal distribution. So why is it important to assess whether the data is following normal or non-normal distribution? This is because when the data follows normal distribution, then we have to choose parametric test. If the data follows non-normal distribution, then we have to go for non-parametric test. The last point, the fourth and the most important point is objective of the study. So under statistics, the objective of any of the study falls under two categories. It is either it can be descriptive or it can be analytical in nature. If the objective states for describing the sample, then we choose descriptive statistics. Example, to determine the prevalence of anemia uh, in pregnant women or to assess the knowledge of medical students on uh, new uh, or any guidelines. So on the other hand, if our objective states for any comparison, correlation, or prediction, then we have to go for inferential statistics. For example, here we have to compare the prevalence of anemia in pregnant women of urban and rural areas. So we are doing some comparison here. So it is an analytical objective. Or to determine the effect of any drug on decreasing blood pressure. So again, it is an analytical nature. So we have to see whether it is a, with what type of objective we have, whether it is descriptive or whether it is analytical in nature. So based on the type of objective, we have to choose a statistical test. If the objective quotes description, then we choose descriptive statistics. If the objective is analytical in nature, then we have to go for inferential statistics. So point to note here is descriptive statistics, they mainly describe the basic features of the sample in hand, whereas inferential statistics, they draw conclusions based on the data observed from the sample. So this is the main difference. So mainly descriptive statistics de deals with the sample, whereas inferential statistics, they infer what the population values could be. So to move, before moving to the uh, test in proper, we'll just revise with the four important steps what we have. The first one is type of variable. See whether it is quantitative or whether it is qualitative. And again, if it is quantitative, check whether it is discrete type of data or whether it is continuous type of data. The second step is type of study. So uh, under the type of study, we have to see whether the uh, group belongs to a paired group or an unpaired group and whether how many groups are there, like whether it's a single group or whether it is a multiple group. The third important point is data distribution. So if the data is continuous in nature, then we have to check for the normality with the help of normality test. So see whether it is normal or whether it is non-normal distribution. If the data follows normal distribution, then we have to choose parametric test. If the uh, data follows non-normal distribution, then we have to choose, choose non-parametric test. The fourth objective is whether it is uh, Oh, sorry, so the fourth step is objective of the study to see whether it is descriptive in nature or whether it is analytical in nature. Let's go with uh, some example here. So we have an example to determine the prevalence of anemia in pregnant women. So here, anemia is a variable where I want to see the percentage or prevalence of anemia in pregnant women. So here the variable is anemia and it is um, discrete in nature. Here there's only one group. Since the data is discrete, so definitely it is non-normal distribution. And the objective says to determine the prevalence, which is descriptive in nature again. So we have to apply descriptive statistics here. We'll go with one more example. So here, um, the objective is to determine the difference of mean hemoglobin in uh, primary gravida and multigravida. So here, the variable is mean hemoglobin, which is continuous in nature. And here we have two groups, primary gravida and uh, multigravida. Since it is continuous in nature, we need to look at the uh, type of data distribution, whether it is normal or not normal uh, with the help of uh, uh, normality test. And then the objective here is analytical in nature. So we have to use both descriptive and then inferential uh, 
uh, statistics. If the data follows normal distribution, then I have then the data should be presented in terms of mean and standard deviation and should be expressed or analyzed using unpaired data. If the data follows non-normal distribution, then it has to be expressed in terms of mean, sorry, median and interquartile range and should be analyzed using a non-parametric uh, test that is man Whitney U test. So now moving to descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics help in describing and uh, summarizing the data that is collected. So it mainly deals with the sample, what we have in our hand. So uh, descriptive statistics actually gives us two parameters. One is measures of central tendency, and one more is measures of variability. The central point of a data set, uh, both the measurements, central tendency and also variability, both are important whenever we are representing the data. Central point of, uh, uh, the central tendency usually represents the central point of the data, whereas the variability measure, it represents the dispersion of the data. So here, looking at measures of central tendency, or it is also called as statistical averages, they tell, they tell us the point or the center number around which all the other items have a tendency to cluster. The most common, uh, commonly used measures for central tendency or mean, median, and mode. Uh, so the central tendency tells us about a single number, whereas we don't we don't know how the other numbers are scattered around. So to uh, locate or to see how they are located or how they are dispersed, so we need to measure the, we need to see uh, the dispersion values also. So in order to know how the scores are dispersed around the central point, we use this measures of, uh, measures of dispersion. The commonly used one are range, quartile deviation and standard deviation. If you see the two sets below, where they are arranged from ascending to descending order, both of them have a median of 50. But if you look at the dispersion, the first set is highly dispersed where it ranges from 5 to 95, whereas the second one ranges from 40 to 60. So to give a better picture of any distribution of any data set, so it's better uh, to represent it in both central tendency and also uh, variability. So when presenting the data, it has to be a combination of central tendency and dispersion. So when the data is of continuous in nature and it is normally distributed, then it should be presented in terms of mean and standard deviation. Similarly, if the data is non-normally distributed, then we have to present it in terms of median and interquartile range. If the uh, data is discrete in nature, we go for more, which is nothing but the proportion. And along with that, uh, to see the dispersion, we usually add a range to it. So in the last session, we have seen again, what is mean and standard deviation. So the mean tells us about the location of the normal curve and then the uh, standard deviation shows about the spread of the numbers. So whenever we are presenting the normally distributed data, we present it in terms of mean and standard deviation. So when the data is not normally distributed, then the numbers have to be arranged in order and then we have to check for the median. So it should be presented in median. It should not be presented in terms of mean and standard deviation. Rather, it should be presented in terms of median and interquartile range. So the dispersion is represented as interquartile range where the numbers covered will be total 50%, where 25% will be below median and 25% will be above median. So mode is used when the data is uh, discrete in nature. Along with mode, we use range. Mode is nothing but the frequently observed uh, uh, occurring observation. So in this data set, we have the frequently observed uh, number is 5 and the range is 1 to 9. So mode and range are used when we have a discrete set of data. So after looking into descriptive uh, statistics, let's move to inferential statistics. Inferential statistics, they take data from the sample and then they make inferences for about the large population from which the sample is drawn. So descriptive statistics, they are applied only on the sample, whereas inferential statistics, they're used mainly to make inferences about the population from the sample numbers. So coming to types of inferential statistics, they are divided into three types based on uh, uh, the type of analysis what we do. If the analysis needed is to compare between two groups, uh, these two groups or three groups, it can be sample to population or it can be uh, two different samples or three different samples. Then when there is a comparison, we go for comparative test. And if you want to see the relation between two variables, then correlation should be used. And if the objective of the study says something to predict, then we go for regression test. So all these comparative tests, correlation test, and then uh, regression test, based on the uh, type of the data that has been there, uh, whether it is normal or not normal distributed, then again, they're again classified into parametric and non-parametric tests. 
So let us first see the compar comparison test. So comparison test, as I said, they mainly look for differences or they look for association between the groups. So in this, let us look into parametric test and subsequently we'll see what are the alternatives for these parametric tests when the data is not normally distributed. So parametric tests in general, they can be applied when the following assumptions are met. The first and the most important uh, point is the data has to be normally distributed and it has to be continuous in nature. So these are the first step. The second one is uh, it should the sample, whichever, whatever we draw, it should follow random or it should follow this probability sampling method. If the data is not taken by random sampling method, then we have to go for non-parametric test. And then parametric tests also assume homogeneity of variance means uh, the variance in the groups, the changes in the groups which needs to be compared, it should be roughly equal. Means uh, uh, the groups which needs to be compared should have roughly equal center tendencies and then roughly equal dispersion. So we will discuss this homogeneity of variance in the next slides again. And the last point is, before applying parametric tests, we have to know the true value of the population. So usually, usually uh, whatever inferential uh, tests we apply, so it's mainly to determine the value of the population. But according to the rule of the parametric test, we have to know the value. We have to know the real numbers of the population, which is usually not possible. So at least we should have, we should assume what value the population can have. So at least we should know the true value of the population, or we have to know the assumed value of the population before applying parametric tests. So under parametric tests, the important point is normal distribution and it has to be continuous in nature. And uh, I'll be uh, discussing about five important parametric tests, one sample t-test, unpair t-test, pair t-test, ANOVA, and then repeated measures of ANOVA. Let's move to the first test, one sample t-test. So one sample t-test is used when the difference between the uh, group and the population needs to be checked. So when we want to see the difference between the sample and then the population, so then we apply this one, one sample t-test. So as I said before, whenever we are applying a parametric test, the population parameter should be known or it should be assumed. For example, so we assume that the mean height of 15-year-old uh, boys in a school it could be 160 centimeters. So just we are assuming that it could be 160 centimeters. As I said in my first slide that we cannot uh, take all the people in the population and we cannot do this, do our study. So what we do is we take a sample. So uh, so in the school, so since because of some reasons, I might not be able to uh, measure all the heights of uh, all the boys. So what we do is we take a sample randomly and then check their heights. Then we test whether this assume, assumption is right or not. So our assumption is the mean height of the uh, 15 year old boys in the school uh, is 160 centimeters. So we'll see what our sample, uh, whatever we have drawn, whether it is showing near to 160 or not. So we, so the assumption, whatever we have done from the population and the, sam and the sample which we have drawn from the same population. So we need to know whether it is same or not. So when we are uh, comparing between the sample and the population, then we go for one sample t-test. The next test, what we have is, unpaired t-test. So here we will be having two independent groups. So this test is applied when we want to know the difference between two sample means. Example here, what I've quoted is to compare the mean hemoglobin in primary gravida and multigravida. So we have two independent groups, primary gravida and then multi multigravida. Uh, one point to notice whenever we are comparing two groups or three groups, we have to test for their homogeneity of variance, which is one of the property of uh, parametric test. So this homogeneity of variance, it means that the variation between the two groups should not be different. In other words, both the groups should have, whatever we are comparing, should have a nearly same mean and same standard deviation. So how can we do it when we are doing the unpaired t-test? Before applying unpaired t-test, the important test what we have to uh, do is we have to test for uh, this homogeneity of variance by Levine test of equality of variance. So uh, I'm not going to the calculation part uh, because we have many online softwares where they uh, automatically give us the results. But uh, before interpreting the results, whatever we get from the online software, so we have to see we have to see the tables like. Uh, what points to be noted from that. So whenever we are comparing any groups or any independent groups, we have to see for this homogeneity of variance. So in unpaired t-test, we have to check this with Levine test of equality of variance. Again, here the null hypothesis says that there is no difference in variances in the two groups. 
if the p value of the levinet test is greater than 5% it is assumed that there is no difference and then uh, uh, both the groups are almost equal then only we can apply the uh, and parity test. For example, here, if you see it, so the p value for Levine test of uh, uh, equality of variance, what we have got is 0. 0.669. It means that there is, the variance between these two groups are almost equal, means they have almost near same central tendency and then same standard deviation. So when we can, when we get this non significance, then we have to apply this unpaired t-test. So point to remember is before applying unpaired t-test, we have to check for the Levine homogeneity of variance and then only we have to go for the unpaired t-test. Then we have paired t-test. So this paired t-test is applied on paired groups. We have already seen what is a pair group. So when we have to compare the continuous variables between two paired groups, then we go for this uh, paired t-test. Example is usually before and after test. So when we want to compare the pulse rate before and after or blood pressure before and after giving any uh, medicine, then we go for this paired t-test or drug A and drug B to two eyes or two different types of uh, instruments measured on the same person. So then we go for this paired t-test to have a glance at the t-test. So when we have single group and we want to compare it to the population to see the difference between the group and the population, we go for uh, one sample t-test. If you want to compare between two independent uh, samples, then we go for independent sample t-test or is also called as unpaired t-test. When we have two readings on the same group, then we go for paired t-test. So whatever we had seen now, it is one group or it, it is two groups. So what if we have three groups in hand? So what test should be uh, added to this. So let us see this in the next slides. When we have three or more than three groups, then we have to apply ANOVA test. Example, here what I've quoted is to find the mean difference of hemoglobin of pregnant women in three villages, village A, village B, and then village C. So we have three villages, means it's uh, nothing but three groups. So from this table, we can tell that the what is the overall mean difference between the groups. So again, F value, it directly tells us about the homogeneity of variance here. Uh, so, uh, the p-value is showing that there is a significant difference between these three villages. So, from this table, we can tell that there is a significant difference between these groups, but we cannot tell uh, which groups mean differ. So, to do this, or to know which groups mean dif actually differ, so we have to do a post hoc test whenever we have a significant ANOVA result. We'll see this in the next slide. So, we have many post hoc tests again. So, the most commonly used post hoc tests are Fisher's uh, LSD and then uh, Bonferini procedures. Um, so, whenever we have a significant uh, ANOVA test, so we have to follow it with post hoc test. So when post hoc test is applied, what we see it from the table is there is a significant mean difference of hemoglobin between village A and village B and uh, between village A and village C. So the P value says that there is a significant mean difference of hemoglobin between these two villages. However, there is no significant mean difference of hemoglobin between village B and village C at 5% uh, significant. So point to remember is post hoc test should be used only when ANOVA shows that there is a significant mean difference among the groups. So if you want to know which mean, which uh, groups are uh, showing the significance, then we have to go for post hoc test. If the ANOVA test is showing uh, it, it's not significant, then we, we are not supposed to use post hoc test. There are two types of ANOVA, one way ANOVA and then two way ANOVA. When we have only one uh, independent categorical factor, then one way ANOVA should be used. So here we have an independent uh, categorical variable that is a study period where it has been uh, categorized into less than five, five to 10, and then uh, more than uh, 10 hours. So three groups have been made and then the study period is being compared to test score, which is a continuous variable and it is dependent one. So when we have one independent variable, then it is called as one way ANOVA. So to this, if I add one more independent variable, like along with the study period, if I, if I want to see the level of anxiety also, then there'll be two independent groups. So when we have two independent groups, then we have to go for two way ANOVA. So in both the one way and two way ANOVA, the, the dependent factor will be only one. So it's mainly categorized based on independent variables. We have one more uh, test called as repeated measures of ANOVA. So this is just like that of the pair test, uh, which was applied when we had the two readings on the same subjects. So if we have uh, three or more than three readings on the same subjects, then we have to go for repeated measures of ANOVA. So instead of uh, uh, comparing two, two groups, like uh, in the previous one, what we had is uh, 
uh, like for example, here what we have blood pressure at first, second, and third months on the same subjects instead of grouping into one, one, one versus two, one versus three, and then two versus three. So it's better to go for repeated measures of ANOVA whenever we have three or more than three readings uh, on the same subjects. Of, uh, so it's like if we have two readings, we have to go for paired. If we have three or more than uh, three readings on the same subjects, then we have to go for repeated measures of ANOVA. There are again different variants of ANOVA based on number and uh, type of dependent and independent variable and also presence of covariant. We have seen about one-way ANOVA and two-way ANOVA and uh, we have ONCOVA, MONCOVA if there is covariant and usually that covariant will be continuous in nature and we have one-way ANOVA and then two-way ANOVA also again uh, with the uh, dependent variables like number of dependent variables. So in one-way and two-way ANOVA it, uh, the dependent variables were only one. If we have two uh, dependent variables then it is called as MONOVA and uh, one-way MONOVA or two-way MONOVA depending on how many type of independent variables we have. To see uh, the tests for continuous uh, data. So when we have two independent groups, we have to use unpair t-test. And then when we have three groups, then we have to go for ANOVA. And if we have two readings taken on the same subject, then we go for paired t-test. And if we have three or more than three readings, on the same study subjects, then we have to go for repeated measures of ANOVA. So these tests, unpaired, uh, paired ANOVA, and then repeated measures of ANOVA, they're all parametric tests. So if the data is not normally distributed, then we have a substitute for this. We have a non-parametric test. Like in place of unpaired t-test, we have to use man whitney u test. In place of ANOVA, we have to go for criskell valis test. In place of Paired t-test, we have to go for Wilcoxon sign rank test. And in place of repeated measures of ANOVA, we have to go for Friedman's ANOVA. So important point to note here is before applying on parametric tests, we have to see whether the data is following normal distribution or not normal distribution. So based on that, we have to select our tests. Moving on to non-parametric tests, the most common non-parametric test, which we all know is chi-square test. So chi-square test also has certain assumptions to be met before we use it. So chi-square test is mainly applied for discrete set of data. So definitely discrete means it is a non-normal distribution and the chi-square is a non-parametric test. So the attributes have to be expressed in numbers for calculation and uh, percentages should not be used. So whenever in any table, if we have both numbers and then percentages, see to it that we are taking the numbers, percentages should not be taken for calculation. And many times we have seen students doing this mistake where they take percentages for calculation. For chi-square, it is the numbers that has to be taken for calculation, not the percentage. The third important point is the sample size should be sufficiently large. Normally, all cell frequencies in the table must be five or it should be more than five. So when we have a large contingency tables, at least 80% of the cell frequencies must be equal to five or it should be more than five. If the assumption is not met, then we have to go for some correction and then we have to apply chi-square test. And the last uh, point is the observation must be independent of each other. In other words, uh, chi-square test cannot uh, I mean, the variables have to be mutually exclusive. So whenever we have a correlated data, we cannot use this chi-square test. For that, we'll have to use McNamara test. So chi-square test is mainly uh, used for two things. One is to find the association and one more is to find the goodness of it. And some textbooks also give us three things. One is a, a chi-square test of association, chi-square test of proportion, and then goodness of it. Uh, but I've, in, and some other textbooks also uh, club this association and proportion into a uh, single category. And even I feel that both almost uh, um, tell us the same thing. So I have clubbed them into two things. One is um, chi-square test of association and one more is chi-square test of goodness of it. Uh, there is There will be no parametric counterpart for chi-square test and uh, chi-square test is applied for both. Uh, um, it's mainly applied for discrete data and where we'll not be seeing whether it is normal distribution or non-normal distribution. Let us look into first example, chi-square test of association. So here chucking the association between two things, one is parity group and then cancer, both are discrete data. So this table uh, displays the observed value. So whatever we have this 50, 50, 4, 50, and then 950 is what we have observed in our study. So uh, for applying chi-square test, we have to calculate expected cell frequency. Like what is the expected cell frequency? How much are we expecting? Uh, how many 
uh, cancers are expected among primary gravida, how many multi gravida should, should have been had cancer. So what is the expectation that we are having? So that also should be calculated. I'll not go into calculation part again. So uh, surface give us the values directly. So this is expected cell frequency where row total into column total, it's been divided by grand total of all cells. So we have to calculate the expected frequency and then we compare this expected frequency to observed cell frequencies. The second application is to test the goodness of it. So here again, the observed values will be compared to the expected values here. So if you see this table, so from sample collected, what it is showing is that there are 70 males and then uh, 30 females in the sample, what we have collected. So considering 50% as probability, so ideally when, when someone asks like what could be the uh, pro uh, gender probability, so definitely it will be 50-50. So we expect 50 males and 50 females to be drawn in that uh, sample. So but what we have observed is we have observed 70 males and we have observed 30 females. So we will be comparing observation and then observed values and then expected values. This is almost like uh, one sample t-test where we are comparing the sample mean to the hypothesized or uh, uh, assumed uh, population mean. So again, here, the same one, there it was mean, and but here it is a, a, a percent, I mean, sorry, the numbers which will be expected. So the observed values will be compared to the expected values. There are two important limitations of using chi-square test. The first uh, limitation is chi-square is sensitive to sample size. So this we have seen the property also. So chi-square is a test can be used only when all the cell frequencies in the table are five, or it should be more than five. So whenever we have any cell which is uh, having less than five, so then we cannot use the sky square test. We have to go for some alternative state. The second limitation, what we have is sky square does not give the strength of association. Rather, it just uses the significance of association between these two variables. So for that also, we have something else, uh, how we can correct it. So let us look into the first limitation of chi square. So what to do when we have less sample size? So before that, we'll understand what is this less sample size. So uh, when the sa total sample in the study is less than 30 or any of the cell has a frequency of less than five, then we call it as uh, less sample size. So whenever we have this less samples, uh, sample size, we cannot use chi-square test directly. For, uh, to apply this chi-square test, we have to go for some correction. So that is called as AIDS correction. So this is specially designed for two cross two uh, contingency tables and the p value whatever we get when uh, after applying age correction is an assumed p value it is not the exact p value so this is one alternative what we can do is the this age correction is just a modification that has been added to price factor one more alternative what we have is the Fisher's exact test. So this is a separate statistical test. So this is not a okay, this is not a, a, a what is modification of a chi-square test. This is a separate test, just like how we have chi-square. So we have this Fisher's exact test. And and this is the uh, well, this Fisher's test is this, it, it can be applied to take contingency tables of any size, but it's most commonly used for two cross two tables. And here the Fisher's exact test, uh, so the p-value, what we get from Fisher's exact test is a chi-square with age correction, where the p-value is an assumption, but here we So is the slide visible? Uh, no, ma'am, your slides are not visible. Okay. Uh, slides are not visible and in between there was a break as well. Uh, the volume was yeah. clear. 
ओके थ्री मिनट्स correction the second limitation what we have is uh, chi square will not give us any strength of association it just Yeah. chi square will not give us any strength of association where so to know the strength of association to know the strength of association we have to uh, use two things one is odds ratio and one is contingency coefficient so everyone knows about this odds ratio now so odds ratio is specially designed for two cross two contingency tables and uh, usually we see this in uh, case control studies uh, so odds ratio it mainly focuses on the relationship how the odds of the events are happening in different groups if the odds ratio is less than 1 uh, so it shows negative association equal to 1 there is no association if it is greater than 1 then it shows positive association between the attributes on the other hand we have one more thing is called as contingency coefficient so which can be used for tables where we have uh, which are larger than 2 cross 2 tables so when we have 2 cross 2 go for odds ratio when we have more than uh, 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 larger contingency tables then we have to go for this contingency coefficient so this value ranges from 0 to 1 where it says no association if it is zero value and uh, perfect association if it is uh, one no give me sir moving further we have uh, one more test called as macmillan test so when we have a paired data so we cannot use chi square test again so paired nominal type of data so just like pair t test we have this macmillan test that is applied when we have a paired nominal data so example here uh, we want to assess the students performance before taking tuition class and after taking tuition class so the options what we have is uh, mutually exclusive and they are discrete pass fail so just like a pair t test how we have so even when we have this uh, uh, paired nominal data then we have to uh, take this macmillan test don't go for chi square test uh, so often we have seen students using chi square test when we have a paired nominal data so macmillan test should be used instead of chi square test here so looking at the brief uh, thing for tests of discrete data so when we have two groups go for chi square test or fisher exact test based on the sample size if the sample size is more than 30 or if any of the cell does not have 5 or less than 5 then go for chi square if if the criteria doesn't meet then we have to go for fisher exact test so even if we have three groups or more than three groups then we don't have a separate test we have again chi square test or we have a fisher exact test if we have uh, paired nominal data then we have to go for uh, macmillan test 
if we have three or more than three again uh, uh, paired data so then we have to Cochrane skew test it is not the McNamara test so these are almost like similar to what we have studied for uh, parametric test it, uh, it's an unpaired t-test ANOVA and then uh, pair t-test and then repeated measures of ANOVA so when we have a discrete data and we see what is the uh, data that we are taking different groups or the same group and then we have to uh, select the statistical test to have a brief look at parametric and non-parametric test type of data so see whether it is categorical or continuous if it is continuous see whether it is normally distributed data so then we can go for one sample t-test unpaired paired ANOVA and then repeated measures of ANOVA depending of, uh, on the objective if it is a non-normal distribution then we have a substitute so one one sample Wilcoxon sign rank test man Whitney uh, sign rank test and then Kruskal values and then Friedman test if the data is categorical then uh, there is no need for any testing of the normality so we have chi-square Fisher's exact test McNamara test and then we have Cochrane Q test. Moving to the second set and third set of uh, statistical tests that is a uh, correlation and then regression. Till now we have seen the comparative tests. Whatever test we have discussed, we are all comparative tests. So now we will see into correlation and then regression. So correlation go together relation is connection. So whenever we want to see the relation between two variables, then we go for this correlation test. So correlation tells us how changes in one variable oh. have an effect on another set of uh, variable. Example, height and weight. So if height is increased or decreased, then what is the effect of it on the weight? So when we want to compare two variables, then we have to go for correlation test. So correlation provides two information. One is... Um, the direction of the relationship and the second one is intensity of the relationship so the direction it can be it is it can be represented either by positive or negative uh, sign when it is positive value it means that both the variables they move in the same direction it means if any changes in one variable i mean increase or decrease in one variable the other variable is also increasing or decreasing if it is negative it indicates both the variables move in opposite directions it means any increase in one variable it decreases the other variable second is the intensity in the relationship uh, between uh, the variables it ranges from zero to one the value of uh, uh, r it indicates the strength of the relationship between the variables so depending on the value the strength can be taken as very low low moderate high moderate or very high so these are the two things and then let us look into properties of correlation coefficient the first point is correlation does not give us any causation it just uses association or how uh, two variables are related. The second one is the correlation coefficient is symmetrical with respect to variables. Means whatever the R value, what we get with respect to height and weight is will be the same between weight and height. So even if we interchange the value, so there is no uh, thing like independent and dependent variables in correlation. It's just like two values, whatever we are having. So the third point is R value lies between minus one to plus one, where it shows us the direction and also it shows us the intensity. And the last properties, the R value is... Uh, uh, it will not have any unit. It is uh, an independent unit of measurement. Whatever it is there, so R value should not be expressed in any of the units. So it is just like minus one to plus one. So as I said, there will be no uh, dependent and then independent variable whenever we are uh, uh, taking this correlation coefficient. So we have to see what type of uh, variables we have, like what is the type of the uh, characteristic of the variables. If both the scales are continuous and it is normally distributed, then we have to go for Pearson correlation. Easy to remember is P parametric, so Pearson. If it is non-parametric, means if it's continuous in nature and it is not normally distributed, then we have to go for Spearman's correlation. And uh, many times we often get confused that uh, correlation should be used for only continuous type of data. It is not like that. We can use for another other set of data also. Like for example here, if both the scales are nominal, then we have to go for phi correlation. If one of the scale is nominal and, uh, nominal and one of the scale is continuous, then we go for point by serial. And if one is nominal and one is ordinal, then we go for gamma correlation. I'm looking at the third now looking at the third uh, set of statistical tests, regression. So when the objective of our study is to uh, see the strength of relationship between two variables, we used correlation test. If the objective of the study says to make predictions or to understand the impact of uh, change in uh, independent variable to that of the dependent variable, then we have to go for regression. 
So why, when are these regression tests used? So the regression tests are used when the objective of the study needs any of these following conditions. The first one is to look for cause-effect relationship. So uh, where correlation can show association, but it will not show us causation, whereas regression can be used to know the cause-effect relationship. The second one is prediction. When we uh, have the values of these independent variables, the regression model can be used to predict the value of the dependent variable. For example, predicting um, occurrence of myocardial infection based on their cholesterol level. So we know their cholesterol level levels. So then we can predict whether they can get MI or not. So this is a prediction. So the second point is prediction. The third one is hypothesis testing. It helps in determining whether there is a significant relationship between this dependent and then the independent variable. The fourth one is to understand the relationship between variables. So regression helps in understanding how changes in independent variables, they are associated with changes in the dependent variable. For example, um, if there is a temp change in the temperature, so how is it going to affect on the occurrence of COVID? Like now we have winter season, so again, the COVID uh, cases are high. So what is the relationship between independent and then the dependent variable? So whenever we have these assumptions or when we want to test these things, then we have to go for regression. There are many types of regression again. So I'll not go in detail for all the regression methods. The most commonly used regression methods are three, simple linear regression, multiple linear regression, and then logistic regression. So when we have one independent variable and one dependent variable, then we uh, we use simple linear regression. It's almost like a correlation value. So let's understand this with an example. Uh, the research question says effect of income on longevity. So income is a independent variable, whereas longevity is a dependent variable. So it can be any of the characteristic, the dependent and independent variable can have. It can be continuous or it can be discrete. So whenever we're having one uh, predictor and then one outcome, then we have to go for simple linear regression, often not used. And the second one, what we have is a multiple linear regression. So here the dependent variable is one, but the independent variables will be too many. So when we have many independent variables, which will be predicting, which will be showing how the dependent variable uh, moves so then we have to go for multiple linear regression example here effect of income and physical activity on longevity so income and physical activity they are both uh, independent variables and longevity is the dependent variable the third one is a logistic regression most commonly used so here uh, there will be many independent variables but here the dependent variable will be one but the characteristic of the dependent variable here is binary means s or no like obese non obese anemic non anemic so when we have this binary option then only we have to go for this logistic regression so example effect of income on survival so here instead of uh, 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 going for longevity so i have changed this to survival so survival so we have only two options whether survived or expired so when this is binary in nature go for logistic regression when it is uh, uh, continuous or uh, in nature so then we have to go for other type of uh, tests one more value which we need to understand when we are applying regression is coefficient of determination. It's also called as R square or rho. This is a statistical measure which gives us the proportion of changes in dependent variable which can be attributed by independent variables in the model. Let's understand this again with an example here. So uh, we have uh, we have weight where weight as a dependent variable where we are want to see the effect of food intake and genes. So we have two independent variables, food intake and then genes, and the dependent variable is weight. And when we have applied the regression, so we have got the R, R square value as 0.72. So what does this 0.72 mean? So 72%, means 72%, it means that the variation in the weight, which is a dependent variable, can be explained by the depend independent variables that is food intake and genes. I repeat, seventy-two percent of changes in weight can be explained by uh, independent variables that is food intake and genes. The other twenty-eight percent can be due to any other factor. See, weight will not be wholly dependent on food intake and genes. So it can be. Uh, there are many other factors where, where the weight can be responsible for. Like it might be physical activity or it might be any underlying disease. So that other twenty-eight percent can be because of uh, any other. Uh, 
factors which we might not have taken in the model. So, uh, so does it mean that we should have a very uh, good R square? Like the should be should we have a greater R square? So it is not like that. So R square doesn't uh, tell us like. Uh, if it is more, then it, it is not that the model is good. If it is low, it doesn't mean that the model is uh, is bad. So it again depends on our objective, whether it is needed or not. So R squared just tells us what is the variation of this uh, dependent variable, uh, whatever in uh, based on the independent variables, whatever we are considering in that model. So finally, we'll move with clan, uh, clinical and then statistical significance. Whenever we understand the statistical significance, there is one more concept which we need to consider that is clinical significance. I'll directly go with examples. Let us read the first example. See, the first example states that two out of 10 rabies patients survived when they were given a new drug as compared to zero survival rate with standard treatment. So when statistically seen, so definitely it will not show us any significance because two out of 10 will be compared to zero out of 10. So statistical significance will not be there. But in reality, even saving one life is important because it is a, a deadly disease. So in such case, we have to even consider clinical significance along with the statistical significance. I'll go with the second example here. A new expensive antidiabetic drug lowers the mean fasting blood sugar by 2 mg percentage. And statistical test concludes that the results are significant. So those statistical significance is seen, but is it really needed to go for a new drug and that too expensive, to expensive drug just to lower the mean fasting blood sugar by 2 mg percentage? So again, see whether it is really important. Uh, to consider it clinically or not. So whenever we are considering the results, so the clinical significance should also be given equal importance along with the statistical significance. To summarize, whenever we are selecting a statistical test, see the four things, see what type of variable it is, type of study, data distribution, and then see what is the objective of the study. So if the data distribution is uh, normal, go for parametric. If it is not normal, go for non-parametric. If the objective says descriptive, go for descriptive statistics. If analytical, go for inferential statistics. So uh, as I said, descriptive or inferential statistics, again, in, in the inferential statistics, there are th three types, comparison test, correlation test, and then regression test. So again, uh, based on the data distribution, they can be classified into parametric and non-parametric tests. So there are many tests, uh, again, uh, under uh, comparison tests. It can be like one sample, two sample, paired, ANOVA, and then repeated measures. If it is non-normal distribution, then we have an alternatives. And if it is categorical data, there is no need for normality test. We have uh, chi-square, Fisher's, Magnumus, and then Cochrane Q-test. So along with this test, whatever I have discussed, so, the, so there are many, again, uh, different tests like um, Cronbach's alpha, then uh, interclass correlation, we have ROC also, uh, and then survival analysis. So there are many other tests. So depending on their objective, we have to choose those tests. So till now, whatever I've discussed is the important test that we see in our day-to-day uh, uh, -day statistical analysis. So any questions, please let me know. Uh, there are some questions, MCQs, which I've, I have shared. So if you want to discuss any of the MCQs, just let me know in the chat box so that we can uh, open that MCQs and then we can have a discussion on it. Thank you all. Am I audible, Dr. Asha? You're muted. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so do you want to take up those or any questions? Say so, yeah, one question is that can we can have give a gist of, of two, yeah, two way ANOVA? Two way ANOVA. So two way ANOVA actually we have to take two independent variables because it is two way. So uh, as I quoted in the example, so um, um, manually we cannot. I mean it is very difficult. So whenever we are going for uh, any software, so they will be grouping them into uh, like. Um, the study period and then level of anxiety, what I had given. So study period had less than five, five to 10, and then greater than 10 hours. And then the second one, what we had is uh, uh, level of anxiety, low or high. So the uh, two way I know it actually groups into uh, five to 10 hours, and then it will take the sub factors into low, ang low anxiety and then uh, high anxiety, and then it will give us the mean values. So I, I doubt, like how I, I don't know how to tell it manually. So it is mainly, it makes groups into two independent factors and then uh, it gives us the uh, mean values. So that's all I can explain here. 
the way to use odds ratio and where to use adjusted odds ratio. The odds ratio uh, is mainly whatever we get it from chi square test, we call it as odds ratio. And whenever we are using logistic regression, so before uh, applying the variables in the logistic regression, so we have to apply independent uh, independent variables. Like uh, each variable should be uh, tested for chi square test, and whichever on application of chi square test, when we get significance, then only we should add those variables to logistic regression. So when we add those variables to logistic regression, the odds ratio. If you're use, if you're seeing the SPSS, uh, how it gives the values. So expo B, whatever the expo B values, the, the what we get is the adjusted odds ratio means we are adjusting the variables which have shown a uh, significance on uh, uh, independent like when we are compared to one is to one comparison is done so when they have uh, shown the significance then we are taking those variables and we are we are adjusting them to the model so that is adjusted odds ratio where to use um, again to know the strength of association we use odds ratio Usually chi-square, we use odds ratio. Adjusted odds ratio, directly we get it from logistic regression. I believe there are no other questions. So any any uh, MCQ question that's need to be that need to be discussed, so I can discuss on it. The the presentation will be uploaded on YouTube, so you can refer to that. It will be shortly uploaded within this week or. It, by can you Monday. please explain uses of Z test? Okay, Z test is actually yeah. Um, this point I'll uh, tell it. So uh, actually, there are two tests: Z test and then T test. So whenever we are reading uh, anything, any references, so what we see is T test should be applied when the sample size is less than thirty. So this is what we usually that is the rule. Like T test should be applied when we have a sample size less than thirty, and Z test should be applied when we have a sample size more than thirty. But often, what we do is irrespective of the sample size, we use T test. This is because, uh, as uh, uh, we know, we uh, we have to know that the population mean and standard deviation should be known or it should be assumed. So in most cases, we will not know the mean and standard deviation of the population. So when we don't know, the second point to uh, see is if we don't know the mean and standard deviation of the population, then irrespective of the sample size, we have to go for t-test. So we should not use this z-test there. So it's better to go for t-test. Uh, because most of the times we will not be knowing the exact mean values or the exact variables of the population. So it's better to go for T test rather than Z test. Yeah, this was a question. Actually, this I don't know how to group different subgroup domain into one new variable. And uh, sorry, Janvi, that really I don't know about this uh, question. Uh, how to group different subgroup? I think you're asking for uh, is it factor, factor analysis? I'm not sure. Maybe it is factor analysis because uh, when we have different subgroups, we have to group it into one factor and then uh, factor analysis. Uh, it's a difficult one. Uh, so I can give an example, but I, I, I'm really not sure how to use that. Uh, for example, if when we are uh, using CBNAT test, so there are many variables what we have, like for example, cost of the test, uh, usage, its results, then training, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, where, where it can be located. So when we have many factors, so when we have many variables, which applied for the uh, analysis part, so then we group them into one factor. Like cost factor will be, all the cost factors will be grouped into one factor and then training, fa all the training factors will be taken into one factor and then we go for uh, factor analysis mm -hmm. where we have uh, exploratory and then confirmatory, but uh, uh, under soft, I mean, in soft SPSS or in any other online software, still now I have not used this. Can chi-square be used for parametric data? No, chi-square cannot be used for, I mean, 
where chi square itself is a non parametric test so it cannot be used for a parametric data parametric data it has to be continuous whenever chi square is mainly applied for discrete set of data and discrete is definitely a non parametric data Any other questions, please? So I don't see any further questions, uh, Dr. Asha. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I don't see any further questions. I hope, like, you know. You've been able to give in the time allotted. You've been given uh, that time in that you have given a good overview and given the details of many of those things as well. So I think uh, since there are no further questions and nobody is uh, I think having any further doubts, so I think we can uh, end the session here. Do you want to like uh, have anything else to say or Trasha? No, sir. Uh, no, so mainly this Z test actually I forgot to include. So this is uh, this is also discussed um, because of the time right. stress. I have just limited myself my presentation to only the important tests. So right. as I said, there are many other tests uh, like interclass correlation, then bland Altman uh, representation, ROC curve, validity of the screen test. So there are many other tests which we uh, use it based on the objectives. So. Uh, Till now, but I've covered most, the important yeah, ones. But the most important and the most common ones have been covered anyway. Yes, sir. Maybe uh, in future, maybe we can think of taking up again. For... Yeah, till we use it, so it might be just a theory part. So till we uh, yeah. use the analysis, so then till that we'll not be able to clearly understand like what are these tests. Yeah, I think right. Dr. Asha, you have covered the must-know competencies or must-know areas uh, of statistics. That would be very frequently used for in any research as such. Right. So I think since there are no further questions, we can uh, I think end it. And uh, it it's like you want to take the Google form or something, Dr. Trasha? Uh, so Google form. Do you want to or few people uh, have attempted it? I think. So just let me know. Yeah. Uh, if at all any inquiries, so if I. If if they want any discussion, so they can ask me in the chat box so that I can go for the discussion. If not, I can end my session here. Yeah, I think that should be fine. Uh, so, so ma'am and sir, with all of your permission, can you end the session over here? Yeah, I think we will end it. Uh, so we would like to thank Clarnet as well as uh, IAPSM Karnataka chapter for having this online session and then Dr. Asha, thank you so much. I also thank Dr. Poonam for having been with us throughout the session. And of course, uh, please keep looking forward to more such sessions, more academic activities that we come forward with. And uh, we hope to have you again on board. So this will be again, as I've been saying, that this will be put up on the YouTube channel. The recording will be put up on the record. And the recorded version will be there. You can actually refer to it anytime. So, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a uh, so thank you night. so much, everyone. Uh, yes. so with all of your permission, can you end the session over here? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.